Okay, so uh, today, guys, we want to talk about uh, what we're calling the uh, links of the chain of survival. Uh, at the end of the day, yeah, we're ROSC rates are important, and and survive, you know, getting patients to the hospital with a pulse and taking good care of them and make sure they have fluid on board and they have oxygen, they have medicines, they have what things we need. But at the end of the day, it's what we want is survivability. So how do we get these people that are maybe in cardiac arrest? How are we getting them to go home? How are we assuring that uh, they are going to have family reunions from now on? <clears throat> As part of that, it takes all of us in doing that. Sometimes it takes the police department to start it, fire, EMS, it may take social workers, it may take our community, community medicine partners. It may take the whole gamut to make this thing happen. So that's what we want to talk about is the uh, chain of survival force. So our objectives tonight, we want to talk about reviewing patient care. We're going to review three reports. One of them being a seizure patient. Um, uh, they had to have advanced airway management, which is something that we don't do a lot of, thank goodness here, but occasionally we do have that, so we feel like it's important to talk. We have cardiac arrest tonight. We want to talk about a severe trauma with jaws and what it takes to, to make all of that mechanism working together as a team. We would also uh, we want to learn about uh, the more common complications of end-stage renal disease. We want to talk about electrolyte abnormalities. We want to talk about ketamine use during ext extrication and the fundamentals of the triad of death uh, that we're going to start talking about. Last but not least, we want to talk about the length of the chain of command. This is uh, ex uh, experience the entire story. We want to go all the way through the 911 call, all the way through our practices uh, from the fire side, from the EMS side, and then from the hospital side. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's something that we don't always get. We didn't get a lot of it in paramedic school or EMT school of saying what happens at the hospital. I find all these things in the field, but what do I get to see on the far, on the inside? Because I feel like it's very important for us as a whole, as a first responder organization, to have that ability to know what, that we, what we saw on scene versus what it really was. And so some of the things we're talking about is when we start looking at our CCF, our compression during cardiac arrest, or if it's an actual stroke or not a stroke. So I get direct feedback now. This started last week. I get direct feedback from UMC right now uh, on all CDAs that we take in. And so that's something that I can forward to Chris Addington from the fire department, and he can send it out to his crew to say, hey, here's what it was mimicking, here's what it looked like, and here's what it was. And it was a CDA, they did TPA, they did clot retrieval, and they did all these different things. So this is something that we're gonna have direct buy-in. And also another thing is we're going to have is compressions. So we, y'all, everybody knows, especially on the EMS side, we have the dashboard on our heart monitors. So on their zone monitor, so I'm able to look at those compressions lifetime, and then the FTOs and senior FTOs are able to come by and visit with you and say, hey, here's where we were on compressions. Here's what your CCF was, and here's why that's important. <clears throat> so we're going to get to talk about this as the whole chain of command or the whole chain of survival. So our first uh, call tonight starts to at the dialysis center. And it's seizure-like activity at the dialysis center. And all of us are thinking, well, is it the V-fib seizure? Or is it the actual seizure coming from the dialysis center? So we can do this to category 31. Both fire and EMS respond to the dialysis center for an unresponsive patient who is in his 30s. Uh, <clears throat> the history is end-stage renal disease. The patient's about 240 pounds. Uh, and there's not really a lot of any other medical uh, history right now at that time. So the chief complaint by the EMS report was dialysis staff reported the patient was alert and oriented <coughs> times four upon arrival and uh, staff reported uh, that all through uh, dialysis he was just fine. After he uh, finished dialysis he became unresponsive and started to have storing respirations and therefore they called 911 and everybody responded. So the healthcare provider started on scene by starting on oxygen. And I want to point a couple of points out because we said right here that it's what we were told initially, it was a non-rebreather. And I'm gonna show why this is survivability important because if they're on a non-rebreather, we know that they're breathing right then. We know that they might be gasping or they might be slow respirations, but they're breathing somewhat because if somebody's gonna put a non-rebreather, we know that they're probably breathing at that time. <coughs> so we do get an initial set of vital signs. We have a pulse ox of uh, 98 with snoring respirations. <clears throat> uh, the patient was found once again unresponsive in the dialysis floor with a non-rebreather mask in place at that time. 
We continue by the first responders. But then when fire gets on scene, we move to a BVM. So they saw right there that there's a problem. There, we saw that we got to move from a non rebreather to a BVM, and they were very quick about that. It's the first thing they did when they got in there. <coughs> they also made a great decision by opening the airway because of snoring respirations. They ended up getting a, a nasal pharyngeal airway in uh, place, so they made that recognition very quickly. Am I saying that's something wrong with the dialysis staff? Absolutely not. I'm saying we had a medical change in that patient and it took that first responder getting on scene quickly to make that decision. We got to change because now I've got a different set of problems here. Now my patient is probably not breathing as well. <clears throat> we get a nasal airway in once again. Very quick about getting an IO in place, uh, which was done. And guys, everybody's names are removed from this for uh, HIPAA uh, reasons. So uh, we, get a, uh, we get a good flash, we get a 10 cc bolus, and we get uh, access there. <laughs> So that tells me really quickly that if I'm able to go to an IO fairly quickly, that tells me that that patient's a lot sicker than just had a seizure or just was a category 31 syncope, which is what we got dispatched on. So as you can see, uh, once transported start, uh, the patient, they did take fire crew in with them. <clears throat> and you notice that uh, the respiratory effort starts to decrease and the decisions made at this time that we need to intubate this patient. So dialysis, intubation, that's a whole new set of problems for us because we've got to get a different drug selection in place. <clears throat> We're still using the BVM and blood pressure is not all that great. So I don't have a lot of options for post care, uh, but you can see that they're ventilating, they're doing the things they need to do. And I got capnography in place at this time. And uh, you see that he's trapping at an end title of 49. They do the passive oxygenization just like we like to at eight liters on a nasal cannula and the fireman happened to be at the head. Therefore, he went ahead and intubated by the fire paramedic <coughs> with was a successful intubation at a 7.0 tube uh, and everything was confirmed and everything went very good. So we say this because what are we doing right now? We're in the middle of transport. We all know that that increases that probability for intubation of being a little bit more difficult because I'm bouncing down the road. I'm not nice and still, or I'm not laying in the floor. <clears throat> and so the nice thing is we had lots of hands in the back and lots of advanced practicing hands that were able to move quickly into that uh, and get the patient intubated quickly. <clears throat> uh, once again, confirmed that it was an ET tube. Now we were uh, checking the ET tube and they're doing this on the way to the hospital as they're backing in. They did note that they had a dislodged tube as the ambulance approached the hospital. They addressed that issue very quickly, started to bag again. So at the same time, you know, it tells us we've got to get that secure airway in place uh, very fast, but they were trying to, you know, do this on the bouncing down the road. And so as they're getting them tubed on the way to the hospital, we have to lose the tube. But once again, it was very quickly caught and uh, fixed immediately. They suctioned the patient, everything was good. As you can see, once again, we're still trapping. Uh, some of this could be from a fluid issue, think dialysis. Although we just got done with the dialysis, you would hope they've got the fluid off, but maybe not always the case. Maybe in a little bit congestive failure. <clears throat> so then we start to talk about the fire report. And guys, their report's a lot different than ours. I had not seen a full fire report. And so it was a lot different for me to be able to read because I get to see a different side. I got to see our report and then I see this one. The biggest thing is, is we've got to make sure that we're talking to each other on scene. I can't stress that enough is I've got to be able to get that great report from them or at the same time, if they're getting on scene after us, I've got to give them report because our reports need to match whenever they go to the state and people are, lots of people are looking at these reports, whether it be a physician, whether it be uh, an attorney at some point, the district attorney or the state. We want to make sure that everything's looking uh, right. So once again, the patient was found in the floor of the dialysis center. <clears throat> Uh, they moved very quickly. Now, right here, we had an assistant with a BVM uh, by the staff. And so that may be something that, you know, well, we saw, we thought, you know, we'd get there and we, we were told it was a non breather and then it went to a BVM. So it's one of those things that's a, maybe a little bit of a conflict, but very quickly they got their AED in place. Patient was unresponsive with snoring respirations at six breaths. That matches what <coughs> we saw at six breaths. The patient had strong regular pulses. <clears throat> and uh, the patient was secured to the cot. And then here comes a little bit more history. Now, in our report, we didn't get the history of cerebral palsy. 
So that's something that we've got to be able to convey to each other very quickly is the full history. And so that once again, our reports will match a little bit closer. Uh, but once again, the, pretty much the storyline goes through that it's the same blood pressure, very close, uh, same ET tube size, everything was looking good. Uh, once again, the, the fire medic uh, intubated here. So that's something I need to document in my report was fire medic and I need to name that fire medic. I need to name who did this skill. And so I need to say that person's name. Now it's been removed for, uh, for once again, for this purpose. But uh, I need to make sure that I'm documenting, that I'm matching their, their documentation of exactly where they are. <clears throat> so let's talk about where we stand then as a service for our intubation statistics. So in the first quarter of 2016, we've had 88 uh, non-premedicated uh, intubations. We've had successful of 83 of them, which is 94% success rate. On the pharmacological uh, intubations, we've had 29 with 27% successful, and we're sitting at 93%. So we're in the high 90s, That's, those are good numbers, but we've got room for improvement. And so this is something that we've talked about in the protocol committee today, that we actually need to start training a little bit more with the difficult airway mannequins while we're doing compressions and trying to intubate with compressions in place. This is something Alan brought up today. It's probably a great point, so that's something that we're gonna start educating because there's always room for improvement all the time. It doesn't matter if this number is at 98%, that's still 2% that we can improve on. And so it's important for you guys to know where do I stand as a provider, um, and part of that is naming it, it's still successful, fire being our FRO, uh, still is important that we have all of those names in that report so we can count that success for unsuccessful. Um, so let's talk about the dialysis patient real quick. So in 2009, there was more than 871,000 people in the United States that were in stage renal or <laughs> ESRD. That's a 600% increase over the last 30 years. Wow. So if we look at the next 10 years, where are we going to be? A lot more renal patients. And so this is something that we really have to start thinking about. The greatest complication uh, is electrolyte imbalance with the number one being hyperkalemia or being a high calcium, I'm sorry, high potassium. Uh, of those 11% of the ESRD patients have a serum potassium of greater than five. Okay, that's at the very high end of normal. And so that's something I've got to anticipate. We all talk about hyperkalemia, I may see the peak T waves. I may be seeing uh, other arrhythmia problems that I have to be able to address <clears throat> or at least have a good understanding of what's going on. Uh, the risk of hyperkalemia, once again, diabetes, congestive heart failure patients, African-American patients, and patients that are on ACE inhibitor medications at home. And so these are some things that I have to be able to cue off on that I need to be prepared for uh, these situations. So as we talk about the hyponutremia, so this is low sodium, some of the signs and symptoms we may see, this is, these are very common things uh, talking about our end-stage renal patients, is the uh, altered mental status, seizing, vomiting, prolonged QT intervals, and I'm stressing this because we're gonna talk more about this in just a moment. So this is a low serum, serum calcium. This is weakness, it can have dysrhythmias. We can start to have, once again, prolonged QT intervals. I'm stressing that because we're going to visit about it more here in a moment. Hypermagnesium, uh, this is a high magnesium level. Once again, cardiac uh, dysrhythmias. We have a loss of deep tendon reflexes uh, and we have a decrease in our respiratory effort. And then we have the hyperkalemia. This is the high potassium. This is where we start to get into, uh, a lot of times we're not even going to know this until we start seeing it on the cardiac side in the field. We don't have eye stats available in the field. so. Uh, one of those things is, you know, we'll be seeing the peak T waves and that's going to be the cardiac disturbance that most common that we're going to see. So let's talk about the prolonged QT interval. As you're running your 12 lead, this right here starts talking about your QT interval. And I start to address these issues because here's what the QT interval, here's what I'm talking about. Normal should be between 350 and 400. And this is something that we didn't get in paramedic school. And this is something that we don't always look at on a regular basis. <clears throat> but what did I say was one of the causes is vomiting with a lot of these disease processes. 
Well, when I'm vomiting, what am I going to be getting? Zofran. Zofran. And what does Zofran cause? A prolonged QT interval. So you can see if I'm already got a prolonged QT interval, I may not be able to give them Zofran at that point. I may have to really address that. Is that something you would have a concern with? My thought on the prolonged QT, so there's a lot of poisonings that we worry about and I can't ever name them all, all on the top, off the top of my head. But it's something, to me, this is the textbook question. Oh, when yeah. you say a long QT, what do you need to think about? Oh yeah, torsades. But in reality, I feel like you never see it. You're at Zofran, I believe Finnergan as well, they can all extend the QT, but it doesn't mean that they do, they just can. Right. And a lot of times somebody has a long QT and it's not a big deal. So this is all, it can happen, but these are very rare right. concerns. It's something you've got to be aware of. Once this extends after 500, then it's something that there's a possibility we could have dysrhythmia. We could have trisades there. Right. And it doesn't mean like, oh, look, their QT is 530, therefore they're going to have torsades. Right. No, it's their extended, so maybe now their chance is a little higher, but it's still probably one in a thousand that they're going to actually go into that. Right. So something you need to be uh, aware of. So this was, so as you can look, this was the patient's 12 lead, post arrest or post uh, intubation and all. And as you can see, you're getting a wide QT interval here. So this is something that we just want to point out that it's something is, is on the ALS side, you've got to be accustomed to of looking at, okay, I've got this issue, the throwing up, I'm going to give them uh, Zofran. This could extend this out. It could cause me some problems. And I just need to have a general understanding of, of what's uh, th that it's a warning sign for me. So we talk about the uh, mortality of our end-stage <laughs> renal patients. Uh, this is the, a total of about 17% of these patients are going to die from their renal disease. But the funny thing, or the, not the funny thing, but the concerning point is 20% of these patients will die in the first year once they start hemodialysis. That's a pretty high number of the very first year going in that we, we're having a, a lot of mortality from them. So what are some of the things that I can do for my end-stage patients? Can I give them fluids? This is something I got to consider the cause of the hypotension if they're hypotensive. Um, are they having cardiac dysrhythmias? Uh, are they truly in a hypovolemic state? Or are they septic? Or are they having hemorrhaging inside? What's going on here? So this is something that I can give them some fluid, but remember we want to kind of restrict that because they've already got fluid on board, <clears throat> especially if they've missed a dialysis for a while and I've already got peak T waves. They need a little bit of fluid. So we want to start between 200 and 250 mils of NS. We want to, unlikely, we want to try to stay away from our LR at this time. So dialysis patients, <coughs> anybody ran to the dialysis center before? Everybody has like, what, three times a day sometimes. So you know, these patients, and, and oftentimes, what is it? <coughs> Nothing, right? You know, their blood pressure is a little high, maybe they had syncope. But obviously, if you think about it, I mean, dialysis, isn't that a really cool phenomenon in medicine that we can do? You know, to think we can take your kidneys out or your kidneys shut down, and yet we can keep you alive. It's pretty cool when you think about it. That machine can do the exchange, essentially take the urine off. Um, so obviously these patients, lots of comorbidities, very sick folks, right? Uh, you know, this particular patient, I think all the care was great. Um, looking at the times, it was probably about 10 minutes from what I saw where we actually kind of bit the bullet to intubate. And that's probably reasonable, but you know, even from the get-go, we were GCS of three. What do we usually say about GCS of what intubate? <laughs> GCS less than eight, intubate. But I think we were already thinking that. We were getting the NPA, getting kind of things rolling. It takes a little bit of time to get things out and get that. Um, so we got the tube in. We lost the tube. Sometimes it happens. Um, obviously, once that tube's in, we really want to try to secure and baby it. I think you said we replaced. I think we were actually backing into the hospital, so we just didn't try to do it. And I think that's an appropriate thing. If we're, you know, less than some distance essentially pulling in the hospital we don't need to go ahead and try to take time to get the two back let's bag the patient get them on in there and then let the intubation happen um, a good point on the fluids on a dialysis patient you know sometimes dialysis patients are hypovolemia not all the time but we don't want to just give them liters at a time we usually will start with like a 250 or 500 cc bolus that probably isn't going to hurt them even if they're actually a little on the fluid upside but so if they're fluid up and you give them a leader, they're going to really be in distress potentially. 
Any questions? So we show you this or we listen to this because we, you need to see how hard of a job it is for those dispatchers. How hard it is for the communication specialist to be able to talk somebody through the simple things of giving somebody a breath and clean out their airway and starting compressions. And you can see he said, no, keep going, keep going. We're trying to start that link, that chain of survivability. And it say, all starts it. Oh, go ahead. I was saying, I see Jaren is Renee here, but this was actually, I'd say, a pretty <laughs> calm call compared to just some of <coughs> I've heard. You know, y'all yeah. hear them a lot more. I, I mean, mean these this, people were. were this was a very calm. even kill yeah. kind of family member. They were focused. And they listened. Yeah. And, and they listened. And so we wanted you to hear this to see what's going on until you get there. That's where the chain of command starts. Mm -hmm. I can't stress it enough. AHA for the first time recognized that it's got to start with the comm center. So is what Jaren's going to talk about real quick is what the process is now because things have changed. First off, I was watching everybody as it was they were going through this and everybody was saying how in the world is it taking so long to start test compressions? Is that fair? So we have a, it's called version 13 this is supposed to been come out for the last two years basically they perfected pre-arrival instructions for cpr now the dispatchers in the very beginning when they say okay tell me exactly what happened if they say they're not breathing they hit the letter o on their keyboard and it takes you straight into chest compression because that takes a lot of time for for him to get to that point it took a really long time so the new way is when they because generally when somebody calls they know their loved one's not breathing and when they say that it's going to fast track it and i think the studies that i read said that it made it about 60 to 90 seconds faster getting hands on chest which is what they're really pushing for so this call is a great example of how the old way we can still get better and with the new cpr standards that are out and how much they're really emphasizing hands on chest with the new way this call they would have started cpr a lot faster and we started it we implemented that i think it was about march 9th so they've been using that since then and another thing that on this particular call i don't know if y'all saw the screen where it said uh, ventilations first there's certain calls that like this was a suspected alcoholic overdose and so the way our protocol reads is we do ventilations first then compressions dr Trout and i discussed this this afternoon with the differences but if you have say you go on a call and they just say they're in cardiac arrest we're going to do compressions continuously until y'all get there on a normal basis i would say 80 percent of the time that's what we have but copd overdose hanging electrocution those are all going to get ventilations first and children if they're younger than eight years old, the way our protocol reads, we're gonna go ahead and do ventilations, if under eight years old, ventilations first, and then chest compressions next. But if they're over eight years old, then we're gonna do constant chest compressions on a regular basis. I don't know, I know a lot of you probably don't, have never seen them before or heard anybody do that before, but Jesus did a great job on getting those people to listen to him, and they were actually performing CPR. There's been cases to where someone was counting out loud with me personally, and I asked the crew when they got on scene, and they said she was running around the front yard pulling her hair out. And she wasn't actually doing chest compressions, but she was counting like she was. And one thing, as you saw, the caller got confused with one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's kind of like a metronome that they came up with to use your voice. Because there's a compression monitor that goes down every time they should do a compression. It goes down, which is why you count. Um, and then, but as far as the CPR goes, you know, it's it's a difficult task to do, but as long as you can take good control of the call, they'll they'll do it. Does anybody have any questions about the process? Thank you.
So I just wanted to show that to show how difficult that, that part of their job really is. Because we don't think a lot about it, but it, it really is very difficult. So Fire uh, does a great job with their documentation here. Uh, it comes in and talks about, they get the uh, defibrillator hooked up pretty quick. Uh, they switched off CPR. This is wonderful documentation right here. I can't stress this enough from a legal standpoint. Rotated every two minutes per your protocol. Very nice job. That's what our crews document that those uh, compressors were, the rescuers were uh, cycled through. Uh, the ambulance arrived on scene and took over uh, prim uh, primary care. And then we got a blue glu blood glucose that just read low. Uh, the paramedics, they started IVs, they done all these things, and then they get ROSC back, um, and then they documented their uh, vital signs. So I can't stress enough how important this is, is to be able to back up, because in case something ever was to come about, you've got, you've got a uh, continuum of care, you've got a continuum of documentation of saying, yes, that's what happened on scene. So let's look at the EMS side. <coughs> Uh, both fire and uh, were dispatched. Fire and EMS were dispatched to the cardiac arrest at 9:55. Um, as you can hear in the recording, they they worked on uh, getting compressions. The Fox unit arrived first. Um, once again, uh, you know they said that the family stated that the patient was just moaning. Uh, they couldn't wake him up, and obviously that moaning was probably some gases, you know, leaving. You heard him gurgle on. Um, on uh, the recording which is you know very difficult for those guys because they got to be able to react to that and what to do next uh, they did know that he had uh, some type of an unknown cardiac history uh, once again denied by any family members and he's got a list of medications they noted that it was propanolol which is a beta blocker so the beta blocker telling me mm -hmm. that there's a good chance that his heart rate's going to be slow <clears throat> at best uh, so they started CPR once again uh, Rotating, they confirmed oh, wow. pulse lists and they, they rotated those with two hand CPR. They did a passive airway, once again with an oral airway and then put a, a non-rebreather mask on. Um, uh, LFR, I found the patient. Then they documented, the crew did a great job documenting. Hey, they here's what fire, so they found them in cardiac arrest, family was doing CPR and we continued that care and moved forward. Uh, they got an IV going, they got Epi on board. Uh, got a little bit of Narcan on board. Blood glucose was attained to read low. That's good because that shows that continuum of care. Once again, we got some dextrose on board. <clears throat> uh, and then another round of epi was given by IV. And uh, <clears throat> then the intubation occurred. Uh, this was, uh, once again, they couldn't get it uh, the first time with the traditional blade. They did not pass the tube. But they made the decision to go ahead and switch. You, you heard that they... He said the patient was very large, and so that it was difficult to roll. That may, you know, indicate that it could be a little bit more of a difficult intubation. They got their King Vision and got him intubated uh, with that with one single pass. Once again, they began to suction. We knew going into it by from dispatch side that they were full of fluid. So you know, bicarbonate was on board uh, due, uh, yeah, due to unsure time uh, of cardiac arrest. <coughs> Return to spontaneous circulation at 10:23, and so as you can see, they got them back fairly quickly, uh, about 20 to 25 minutes on scene. Um, but based on the emergency room labs, which we get as a benefit at the hospital, uh, the patient was in metabolic acidosis and severe hyponatremia or low sodium, which we've talked about as a dysrhythmia issue. Uh, so. They uh, once again got them back fairly quick. They've uh, end titles were looking good, and so he's got, got good gas exchange now. Uh, so they addressed the poor perfusion. They got some dopamine on board. Uh, remember, that's going to increase with our alpha and our beta agents. Contract that we're going to get a little bit of squeeze from that from the alpha side, and a little bit of contractility from the beta side of that. Uh, they didn't get a lot of effect at five micrograms, so they increased it to ten. <clears throat> this is actually uh, the 12 lead uh, from there showing a big massive MI. Now, did he have an MI and then go into cardiac arrest or did he suffer an epoxic event and then go into cardiac arrest and suffered an MI secondary to that? That's the age old question. But as you can see, once again, you have uh, the elevated ST segments there uh, pointed out as a STEMI. Once again, prolonged QT interval. This is something, you know, with 
disease process that could be a factor uh, in place, but it was a little bit long. It wasn't over the 500 mark, uh, but it was a little bit above average. Uh, so ROSC was, uh, once we got ROSC, he started to uh, bite on the tube a little bit, so they had to sedate. So we want to talk about our fentanyl and ketamine. Uh, they tried fentanyl first because they had a low blood pressure. Uh, they got the dopamine on board and then they called medical control, granted orders for ketamine post the opiate administration uh, and uh, did very good job with that. And then we started to target temperature control was contraindicated here because of the renal disease process. <coughs> so we're going to withhold the hypothermia here. Now at the hospital, they may go ahead and start it, but in the field, we're not going to do that. Remember, we've also removed the fluid. Uh, from hypothermia per AHA being a class 3 hazard now. We did start the dopamine and increased it to titrate to 10 mics to uh, micrograms per kilogram to increase the blood pressure. Uh, heart rate remained in the 60s. Uh, serial 12 leads were done showing a lateral uh, MI and blood glucose finally was renoted at 267 and this was as we were pulling in the hospital. <coughs> so Patients continued care at the hospital. So what all did they find? Cirrhosis of the liver, uh, hypertension, in sta or stage one esophageal varices. So there's where some blood comes into play. Alcoholism. Um, and then we had our 12 leads showing a ST segment MI. And so we also had a positive troponin at 0.12. And so that's gonna tell us that we are, once again, did we have the MI first or did we uh, go into cardiac arrest first. And keep in mind that troponin would elevate just from thumping on the chest as right. well. Right, right. And that was some of the, <coughs> the questions, where did that come from? So the diagnosis uh, was an upper GI bleed, which is hence the varices. We had a lateral wall STEMI, uh -huh. acute liver failure, acute kidney disease. Was that caused from the cardiac arrest? Don't know. Pa uh, he was diagnosed with seizures and severe um, metabolic acidosis. So we look at some of his labs. He came in at 6.8, okay, very, very low. Uh, normal members should be 7.35 to 7.45. <coughs> um, sodium was uh, extremely low. Chloride, CK, remember CK is very specific and CKMB is enzymes released, but guys, I could go jog down the stairs and my CK would probably be elevated from muscle damage. So uh, that's not saying a lot, especially with me. Probably not that high though. I mean, getting up in no, the thousands. Mine would be though. Uh, maybe. <laughs> My BNP starts to talk about congestive failure. I have a positive, so I'm in congestive failure with that. Secondary could be from cardiac arrest. And once again, the troponin and his alcohol level was 185. <clears throat> but the good thing is, is your drug screen was negative for anything. <clears throat> so during the hospital admission, <clears throat> uh, his low blood pressure uh, <clears throat> continued and ended up having to be on an epi and a norepi drip. Uh, along with the dopamine, so he went to leave a fed also. Said head CT was clear. Patient was diagnosed once again with a STEMI, a GI bleed, <laughs> and uh, was not a candidate for PCI or TPA treatment. Uh, sodium bicarb was given gradually and slowly to help uh, get him off, get uh, the acidosis taken care of over time, <clears throat> and uh, severe uh, short duration of seizures while in the ICU, so they had to start him on anti-seizure medication, and then he coded again in the MICU. <clears throat> Due to the very poor prognosis, the family ended up signing DNRs and the patient passed uh, sometime later. So we wanna talk about some of the H's and T's because this is something we don't always hit. We don't always get all the H's and T's, but we wanna just review them. Hypovolemia, maybe. We didn't know he had a GI bleed until we got to the hospital, but we're gonna replace that. We're gonna fix it with crystalloid fluids. Remember our hydrogen ion, this is where we start talking about our acidosis. From a prolonged downtime, this is where our sodium bicarb and oxygen comes into play. Hypoxia, it could be from the emesis, we knew it was gurgling and a long downtime. Once again, oxygen is securing the airway quickly. Uh, hypoglycemia, they took care of that. Uh, yes, they, uh, that was definitely a factor here, so they gave him some sugar. We have a hyper or hypokalemia, maybe, I don't know, prolonged QT interval, you could have Peak T waves if they're hypo, hyperkalemic. So it's something, is there any really hospital treatment for that? No, not really besides fluid. Hypothermia, no, he was at room temperature, so we don't really worry about that. Thrombus, could be, we had an MI, but we had stagnant blood. I mean, once again, was that MI because of anoxia? Or was it because of thrombus before? Not really sure. 
but the 12 lead was done in the field after obtaining ROSC. Thrombus respiratory wise, maybe, you don't ever know. I mean, he's got full of fluid, but that's probably more emesis at that point. We can suction and, and do tracheal suction once we get them intubated. Toxins and pills uh, or tablets, this is where uh, we did know that going into it, he was alcohol, but we can still go ahead and follow with Narcan and fluid bolus. Tamponade, maybe for our compressions. You know, you don't ever know, but that's very hard to diagnose in the field, especially if they do not regain a pulse. Tension pneumothoraces, unlikely since the lung assessment was very good. We had clear breath sounds once we got them intubated. And trauma, they did <clears throat> note some mild bruising, but they did a very good job documenting that. So they did find that there was a little bit of trauma, but was that the cause of his arrest? Probably not. <clears throat> so here's kudos. Here's kudos to the fire crew. Here's kudos to EMS. Here's what their CPR looked like. Uh, very, very good, right in the frame of 2 to 2.4, right, uh, right in the perfect rate of 100 to 120, with 110 being the sweet spot. And this is what we're looking for, right here. CCF, this is our compressions in target. This is 86 percentile, that is incredible. That means I had a perfect rate and a perfect depth 86 percent of the time. That is an astronomically high number. <clears throat> Actually, AJ, go ahead. Like go back one to the, and also, I mean, you can tell right, no, one more. You can tell right when we're switching, who's giving compressions, but just look how short that time, well, on the very bottom one, yeah, or the bottom yeah. one, the long, that's good too. Obviously, we want to have minimum interruption. Yeah. I'm okay. assuming that's several <coughs> providers swapping off. So these are going to be some of your change outs, these little bitty marks, and this is where we got ROSC. Yeah. This is all Ross right here. So you can see they did a very, very good job. Quick change out. Uh, you know, guys, we see a lot of times the lieutenant, it's funny, they'll say, okay, you get ready, you get in line, and they'll switch, and it's a very, it's a uniform process. And that's how we keep our CPP up. That's how we keep our CCF up. That's how we keep our ATP present at all times to give our hearts something to work with. So at the end of the day, the compression rate was 1.9 or 109.41 and average depth was 2.2. So we're right there in the range, 86.4%. If you look right there where it says time of compressions, the 13 minutes and 15 seconds, down, right down, 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 right there. Time not in compressions, 28 26 seconds. seconds. Yeah. Is it 26? 28, yeah. yeah, 26. So that's- That should have been six providers or so. Yeah. That's awesome. yeah, so that's awesome when so, we see that. Very good job. Seconds. Now, AHA this year for the first time has come out and said, so what should CCF be? What should be the compression compression fracture be of the perfect rate and the perfect uh, depth? By AHA standards, it should be at 60% or better. Guys, these guys were at 86%. We see this a lot. That's why during codes, a lot of times, you'll see patients be able to follow command and blink. We had a code the other day at minute 62. I asked the patient, blink if you understand me, and he blinked. He'll def when we defibrillate them, they'll moan. That's because we're perfusing. That's what CCF, that's why we've preached so hard for so long to get great compressions. This is what we're seeing right here. And now AHA has finally said, hey, that's right. It needs to be at least 60%. I would probably say our mean average is between 68 and about 72. Is that fair? Somewhere in that neighborhood, 74. Somewhere in that neighborhood on average. So we're well above the curve, but do we have room for improvement? Absolutely so. And that's why we continue to, to practice about this. So one of the compressions is AHA also stated this year, we do not recommend routine use of passive ventilation techniques. Uh, for conventional CPR patients. However, if you are an EMS system and you use a bundle of care, which is what we do with two services, lots of help there, then we do recommend the passive oxygenization that can be part of that bundle process. Remember, <coughs> with our passive oxygenization, that's very important because I've removed all the pressure off my chest. I have maximum blood flow from my inferior superior vena cava, so I'm able to maximize my flow back to my heart to give me the maximum amount of dose of ATP present to give my heart something to work with. That's why we've gone to the passive airway. So what does this mean for us? Passive uh, ventilation, 
uh, is relatively new and still being studied a lot. We'll be studying it for a lot longer, but not everybody qualifies for it. So who are the patients at UMC EMS and the County of Lubbock, the City of Lubbock, Lubbock Fire, who are the ones we're not gonna do this on? These are pediatric patients. These patients need oxygen. That's the number one cause of pediatric arrest. <coughs> Suspected hypoxia. So if their cardiac arrest is from a respiratory cause, makes sense. I need to ventilate them quickly. <coughs> Traumatic arrest. They definitely need the oxygen or a dirty airway with emesis. <coughs> I need to make sure I get that cleaned out and get them oxygenated. All right, passive oxygenation. That's one of the biggest thing I want to talk about here. You know because it seems to continually get brought up a lot. And just like AHA said, you know, they actually are not, they're not putting it out as a class A recommendation. They recognize people are doing it. They still kind of say, eh, good, bad, or indifferent. Remember that six minutes is not magical. If we look at where, we look at all EMS agencies, obviously there's some that absolutely passive oxygenation, what are you talking about? They have no idea what we're talking about. They don't do it. And there are agencies that do passive oxygenation to ROSC and see as the patient wake up and breathe on their own or do they intubate? And then folks in between. That six minutes was, I don't know who was the first to use six minutes, but quite a few of the people that do do kind of the hybrid model, which is what we do, use six minutes. And again, and I hope nobody should be being punished if they did it for eight and a half minutes or if they did it for four minutes. You know, that six minutes is to focus on what's important, getting pads on, getting the AED, or the monitor, seeing if we need to shock the patient, getting that good routine of switching out for providers, giving good chest compression, <coughs> kind of getting in a good environment, then focus on that airway. Everybody understand that? The other thing that seems to keep coming up is, well, is it a dirty airway or not a dirty airway? And you know, yes, there's those obvious ones. You know, if they're gurgling blood or gurgling emesis, I don't think anybody has a problem with that, but. Yeah, there are some, okay, we put the non-rebreather. Well, there's some fluid in there. Is that dirty or not? It's a judgment call. You know, just make a judgment call whenever somebody from the <coughs> entire system makes that judgment call, go with that judgment call and go with it. Okay, does that make sense? <coughs> the other thing, keep in mind, you know, and I hope we're not standing there with our clock going, okay, it's almost been six minutes, let's get ready and intubate. But remember, we kind of look at that passive oxygenation uh, starting from when we know the patient's getting good chest compressions. That may or may not be at the nursing home. We all know you've walked into nursing homes and seen good CPR going on, and sometimes we walk in and see not so good CPR. So just keep that in mind too, use that judgment. If these guys are there, their time's counting, okay? If they've been there for six minutes already, then our passive oxygenation's done with, because we know they provide great CPR. Any questions? So a good case, got ROS, you know, alcoholism, <coughs> liver disease, it catches up with you at some point and unfortunately caught up with this person. Okay, so last case, <coughs> the ultimate MBC. Uh, we had a wreck in her, uh, the car was at about a uh, 45 degree angle <coughs> um, and it took about 35 minute extrication on scene. Uh, the patient was, uh, some uh, was alert and but slow to respond on a, on everybody's arrival so fire does a very very nice job documenting one to two feet intrusion on the driver's side with airbag deployment the car was at a 45 degree angle on a hill now that's one thing i was going to talk about i don't know of any hills in west texas but it was down in a ditch but they did they documented that it was good because the car was offset they had a lot of trouble with this extrication because that car was unstable so they did a nice job firming up the car uh, so everybody can get to work. Did a great job documenting that uh, C collar uh, that they held a manual C spine uh, through the window until somebody could get in the vehicle. Um, but you could not get to the patient below the waist due to the wreck. Uh, EMS arrived, exchanged information. That's good. It gives it tells you there's a great continuum of care there. Uh, they also notified uh, JAWS really quick to, I'm trying to think where it was, uh, somewhere in here, right. but anyway, <clears throat> they <clears throat> got JAWS coming, uh, they load them and they, they got, finally got them extricated, uh, an IV was started with medications given, um, they took care of uh, the deformed arm while they were working on every, getting the extrication done, and then uh, EMS transported. I think I'll mention, and I mean we all do a great job, but I think Fire in particular does a really great job on kind of describing the scenes. 
And that's often important because just like on this patient, I don't know, I don't think it was, but let's say there was a delay in something, you know, we can always go back and say, ah, you know, look at this situation. It's obvious there's a delay. We didn't want providers in positions where they potentially could get hurt. So, uh, so she will answer questions. Once again, she was slow. She was uh, a little bit delayed in her answering. Uh, did a good job, had a three inch lack to the top of the forehead, uh, a lot of pain to the upper shoulder, to the arm, very detailed documentation. And then we start to talk about our portion of the wreck. Now, our portion of the wreck, they started talking about, well, it was a possibly a head on collision. Uh, the position of the vehicle changed due to impact. The roof was caved in, the steering wheel was deformed, major damage. Once again, we're just backing up what the first report said from fire. That, <coughs> that you know it was a difficult extrication once again the vehicle it was very hard to get into the vehicle finally somebody was able to get in they did take spinal precautions that's that continuum of care you see that on both sides of the report that everybody was taken care of we got oxygen on board by first responders by an honored breather uh blood pressure was noted at 80. i got an iv fairly quickly once again everything was blocked from the waist down they chose to use ketamine at 0.5 milligrams per kg <coughs> for extrication purposes. Remember that our ketamine does not affect our hemodynamics. So even during trauma and blood, I can still give them this drug in order to drive pressure. Chad, you said they got an IV. Did they get a ketamine IM? Or did they IV. It has to be given IV for, for extrication purposes or for pain management also. Um, so there's really not any changes. They arrived at the emergency room. Blood pressure, 88 originally. Now, of course, they got her extricated. They got her laid flat. Blood pressure is now 152 over 91. Heart rates come up a little bit. Great end titles. Remember, end titles are required on all ketamines to prove that they are breathing the whole time because I have waveform capnography with that. Uh, once again, the IV, they got a blood draw. Pressure's really good. Um, pressure started to come back down. Remember, at about 10 minutes, that ketamine is going to spike in a little bit of a blood pressure and then it'll start heading back down. Um, so what all were her injuries? She ended up having a left anterior pre, uh, pelvis fracture. She had a sacral fracture. She had clavicle fractures bilaterally and I've got pictures of all these. Uh, there is the bilateral clavicle fractures. She actually has a rib one fracture right there too and with a displacement. How much pressure does it take to break rib one, Dr. A lot. T? Yeah. A lot. So that tells you she took a lot of impact right there. She also has a pelvic uh, ramus fracture down low. She has a comminuted uh, left femur fracture, as you can see. She also has a left elbow fracture. She took a lot of impact on, and everything's correlating. She had fire documented one to two inch intrusion, I mean foot on her door. And so with uh, airbag deployment, she ended up having blood in her urine from an unknown source, a negative drug and alcohol. H and H was 10 uh, and 31. <clears throat> and then she was electively intubated uh, for surgery purposes and uh, because her decreased LOC. And then we had a huge drop in H and H down to six and 18, which she had to be transfused for. She had an extended hospital stay. This is not a picture of hers, but she had uh, fixations uh, done in order to start repairing all of her uh, processes. So the education portion of this, guys, remember ketamine is a perfect for this situation. It will help at 0.5 mils per key. They should still be able to have a conversation with you at some point. But at the same time, I'm not going to have to worry about my blood pressure. I'm going to drive my pressure if I'm going to do anything with a little ketamine. And it's going to peak at about a 10-minute window. This offers hemodynamic support, once again, in a trauma situation. Um, due to the ability of the neuron uptake of the catecholamines. Remember that our dose right here is 0.5 milligrams per key IV IO. And we use this IO here. What about if their arm's caught in a meat grinder and they're stuck like this and I can't get to an IV here, I may have to go IO at that point. So we give you that ability to, to make those decisions. <clears throat> we want to avoid the triangle, the triad of death. Guys, remember we start talking about the uh, hypothermia, the acidosis and the uh, coagulopathy. So how do we avoid the acidosis? One of the biggest things is oxygenation and ventilation. Make sure that they're breathing well, that we're not in a respiratory state at that point, uh, that I'm starting to build lactic acids and ketones in the bloodstream. I need to make sure that they're breathing good or I'm ventilating them good. 
On the hypothermia side, keep our patients warm, turn the heater on in the truck. It might be 90 degrees, might be 100 degrees outside, I still may have to turn that heater on to heat those trauma patients up there. The reason why our trauma bays are hot whenever we roll in. Uh, avoid uh, coagulopathy. Uh, this is where we want to avoid the excessive fluid. This is where we allow them permissive hypotension. Allow them to put the large bore IVs in uh, with the large bore INT. Remember they're the 0.9 mils. They're going to tolerate 3,000 cc's an hour through those. But we, if we start giving them fluid, I'm going to start washing out my H&H. &H. You can see our H&H &H already dropped. And so we want to prevent diluting that out with fluid. I'm not about much here to add. I mean, we do a lot of trauma stuff. So let me ask this. So if they had, what, an elbow, femur, a couple clavicles. So if this patient's 22 years old, what do you figure their mortality rate's going to be? Pretty low, right? What if they're 70? Probably not going to make it. I mean, you get a couple long bone fractures and an elderly person, their chance of survival is very low. If most of us in here get it, except for maybe a couple of you, um, our chance of survival is very high. So trauma patients, youngness is on your side. Thanks, Doc. Appreciate it. Uh, let's point it over this one. Yeah, yeah, you talked about the of hypotension. I think we do a pretty good job doing that. Our trauma service here, um, certainly at UMC, likes that we do that. You know, that's kind of become one of the newer things in trauma. It's not only the washing, washing out of the coagulation factors, but it's also just like this patient, let's say they just had a complete liver lack. You know, they might have clotted that and they're a little, maybe they're, they were 90 systolic and we throw them two liters of fluid, we just have a greater chance of literally just pushing that clot out of the way, and guess what, that sucker just goes to bleeding again. So that's kind of the, a lot of the theory behind the permissive hypotension. Any questions? Good.